Hello, welcome to Life Matters. I'm your host, Brendan O'Connell. Our show today has two distinct topics concerning embryonic stem cell research. Remember several years ago, the biological research community was clamoring to do embryonic stem cell research? Well, those who are pro-life objected because it involves cloning and killing a nascent human being at the embryonic stage of life just to do medical research. A recent article in the scientific journal Cell from the scientists at Oregon Health and Sciences University appears to have given a boost to human embryonic stem cell research. Is it really an advancement uh, to real therapies that could uh, help people, or is it uh, just a more efficient way to kill embryonic human life? The second topic concerns the status of the federal government funding of human embryonic stem cell research. Today's guest, along with Teresa Deicher et al., have had several lawsuits against the federal government. Our guest shares his thoughts regarding these lawsuits. He represents another important voice in the broad mosaic of the Right to Life movement. I confidently believe you'll find today's show to be unique, informative, content-rich, truthful, and thought-provoking. Today's guest graduated from Harvard College with a degree in biology in 1980. He then graduated in 1988 from Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, earning a joint MD and a PhD degrees with an emphasis in biochemistry and molecular and cellular biology. Uh, uh, in the interest of the public good, he's an advocate of improved scientific disclosure. Well, welcome to our guest, Dr. James L. Shirley. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shirley, what do scientists at uh, the Oregon Health and Scientists uh, University claim uh, to have done, and have they cleared a, ver a very difficult barrier to therapeutic cloning? So the scientists at, uh, in Oregon <coughs> have cleared a barrier, and it's a barrier that they've been working on, not necessarily this group, but groups since 2004. And basically what they've been able to do <coughs> It's the first make human embryos um, using um, eggs that they um, get from women. And those eggs have been, they've had their genetic material removed from them. And then the genetic material from a mature cell from the body, like a skin cell for instance, has been placed into the egg to make an embryo. And then the barrier that they've gotten across, so those are called cloned embryos. And so they've now made embryonic stem cells from cloned embryos. And one of the things that that provides is the opportunity for scientists who wish to do such research to make lots of embryos, to make lots of embryonic stem cells. And so that wasn't possible um, in 2004, and now it is. I see. And um, now, embryonic stem cell research uh, is beleaguered because little to no advancements have taken place, so much so that James Thompson from the University of Wisconsin and Geron Corporation in California have gotten out of embryonic stem cell research. Does this article in the research journal Cell change the pattern of failure? And if, if not, why? I don't think it's going to change it at all. I think one of the things that the public needs to be aware of is that the, the sort of the, the cry of what we, the promises for embryonic stem cell research is that it will provide us with new cures and new therapies. And the idea is that the reason these embryonic stem cells are able to do this is because they're able to, quote unquote, make any cell in the body. And one of the things also been learned in the last nine years well, or so. Well, was that a true statement or was that a hope that they could make any cell in the body? It was always made as if it were true. That statement is often made as if it's true. But in fact, it's always been a hypothesis. It's always been an educated guess about what they might be able to do. That's mm -hmm. been the promise. And that's being reported now along with this new advance. The truth of the matter is, in the last nine years of research, what we've learned now is that embryonic stem cells cannot make every cell in the body. 
And in fact, the most important cells that one would want to make for cell therapy are mature cells, the kinds of cells that are in our liver, and in our eyes, and in our skin currently, now, as adults or as children. In fact, these cells have so far only been able to make immature cells. So these would be the types of cells that you would find, for instance, in a fetus. And those cells are not able to provide the kinds of cell replacement therapies that we are interested in, that we've been told that embryonic stem cell research can bring us. So one of the things that everyone should recognize is that it's now known that embryonic stem cells can't make every type of cell in the body. So basically, all this stem cell research article says is we can make a lot of them now, but the reality is, is because it's embryonic, it can't be mature, a mature cell. Yeah. And therefore, uh, the, all these therapies and cures that are hoped for are, it's not the way to go, basically. So it's not going to happen. And I think it's unfortunate that this aspect of the research, which has gone on for the last nine years, not only has it been unreported, un underreported, it's been unreported. And it's been, un been unreported because they haven't had any successes, is that? Well, I think some of it is because uh, reporters uh, come to these, uh, come to scientists with their already written, and they look for confirmation. So don't ask the right And there's no reason, I think, in many cases for investigators to tell about the problems that they're having with their research. They are more inclined to tell about the successes as we're hearing about now. And what are some of those problems? Well, some of them haven't changed. And the most, uh, I think, important one for embryonic stem cells is that, and that has been reported, is that they form tumors when you put them into mature tissues. Mm -hmm. And so one has to figure out how to solve the tumor formation problem with embryonic stem cells to have any chance of success with transplantation therapy where you take cells and put them into the body to fix some part of the body um, that's ailing, that's uh, diseased. Um, the other problem that we don't hear reported because some say it's very complicated, but I think we can talk about it briefly here. Um, the problem is that the cells are embryonic stem cells. So these are cells that were made to work in the embryo. They were never made to work in a mature body. And they can't work in a mature body because what you need a cell to do in transplantation therapy, like we currently have for, for instance, bone marrow transplant, where you replace the bone marrow, the cell has to do two things. It has to not change because it has a blueprint for making the tissue. It's got to stay the same. And at the same time it stays the same, it has to make a mature tissue. So a good example is our hair. Our hair is really a mature tissue. It's made continuously, but if you look in the bottom of a hair follicle, there's no hair shaft, there's cells. Those cells are not changing, they're producing something that's becoming different. That's what adult stem cells do. Embryonic stem cells are unable to do that. When they make any other type of cell, they cease being a stem cell themselves. Uh-huh, interesting. So then are mature cells needed for envisioned applications, let's say in drug discovery or cellular ther therapy? Or for possible cures to human sickness and maladies? So if you think about it, if you're going to be treating someone who's, zero, you know, who's a, a newborn or a child or an adult, you need the types of tissues they have in their body. And those are mature tissues. Mm -hmm. So these immature tissues will not work. We are bigger than fetuses now. And to cure the kinds of problems we have as adults and, and children, you need mature cells. Mm -hmm. well, let me ask you, uh, a couple of years ago, um, uh, I thought induced pluripotent cells obsolesced embryonic stem cell research. Uh, and if so, uh, why are American taxpayers just throwing money away at backing more embryonic stem cell research? You know, Mr. O'Connell, I thought the same thing would be true. <laughs> I, in fact, remember saying that uh, embryonic stem cells would basically go out of business because of induced pluripotent stem cells. So just to give a, a bit of a definition, induced pluripotent stem cells is a new tech, are the results of a new technology. It's been around now for about five years or so. And basically what scientists are able to do is to take any mature cell, or most mature cells from your body, and turn them into cells by genetic engineering, turn them into cells that have the sort of key property of embryonic stem cells, which is called pluripotency. That's the word that gives rise to this idea that embryonic stem cells can make any type of cell in the body. 
So induced pluripotent stem cells are very similar, and they have one really major social advantage. No one has to die in order for them to be made. Consenting adults provide the cells. They're engineered in the laboratory. There's no embryo in the process. And you get a cell with the same properties, essentially, as an embryonic stem cell. They're not identical. And scientists have kind of quibbled over this. But in my opinion, they're, for the kinds of things we'd like to learn with embryonic stem cells, how does development work, that type of thing, they're good enough for that. They're just as bad as embryonic stem cells, though. They form tumors. They can only differentiate into immature cells. Uh, and they can't do this, what we call asymmetric division, not change while making a different cell type. But for a lot of the things that scientists want to explore in terms of understanding human nature, these cells are really quite adequate for that. What's holding us back? Scientists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, they, is it to just the sake of they, wanna, they just want the research money from us and uh, come hell well, or high water? It's a bit more complicated. I think there's a little bit of that going on. But we, I think what the public doesn't understand is what we are like as scientists. Um, we're like you. We like to do what we've been doing. It's easier to keep doing what you're doing than to do something different. When embryonic stem cell research came on the horizon and scientists were able to, there was such excitement around it, no one stopped to think, gee, what are we actually doing? And it's the same thing in some ways now, even though there's now another way of generating the same type of information, the scientists who are ingrained and entrenched in doing embryonic stem cell research basically are having a hard time changing, and we've got to help them. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, I'd like to shift now over to, uh, you uh, were involved uh, uh, with a lawsuit, and uh, I guess maybe we could start with, uh, in 1996, there was something called the Dicker Wiki Amendment. Uh, why is this important, and why is it important for uh, human embryonic stem cell research? Well, I think the, the first reason it's important is because what it means is that when uh, President Barack Obama um, put out his executive order um, to allow funding of embryonic stem cell research, he broke that law. Mm -hmm. And our court case was about the fact that that law had been broken. And what the law is, in 1996, and note this is before embryonic stem cells were available, human embryonic stem cells. This is two years before they first were produced. Congress was concerned about embryos being harmed, damaged by research. There was this new idea around of doing things like using uh, embryonic tissue for treating things like Parkinson's. And Congress wanted to make sure that these human beings were not destroyed by research. And basically, Dickey Wicker is a law that says that the NIH, the federal government, cannot fund research that causes the risk or the actual risk of injury or injury to human embryos. Mm -hmm. Well then, um, uh, what was uh, on, now we're going to fast forward, let's see, it's 13 years later, March 9th of 2009, there was an executive order 13505 by President Obama entitled, Removing Barriers to Responsible Scientific Research Involving Stem Cells. What was that all about? Well, basically, he kept one of his campaign promises. And when he was elected in 2009, he said to the NIH, um, I'm giving you the freedom to uh, fund embryonic stem cell research as long as it's legal, ethical, and worthy. And it's neither of those three. It's not legal by Dickey Wicker. By the Dickey Wicker because Amendment. Because you can't do embryonic stem cell research without destroying embryos. And it's not ethical, that's, that's why we're here, because it ends up in the loss of life, of human life. And we've talked already about why it's not worthy of the money we're putting in, because it can't deliver the things that are being promised. Well, now, what were the NIH guidelines uh, to research uh, in the human embryonic stem cell research? What, what kind of guidelines were they using? And, uh, well, there weren't any before. Because, uh, because of the Bush resolution, there wasn't any funding taking place. So when President Obama came into office, uh, they had to develop them. And that's what they did. They developed new guidelines that basically said you can use embryonic stem cells for, um, for research with some guidelines about how the embryos came in, how the embryos were sourced for making 
uh, the embryonic stem cells. Mm -hmm. Well then, uh, what were uh, what did you file you and uh, that lady and, and others? A, a Teresa Deischer. Teresa Deischer. Dr. Teresa Deischer. Uh, there were and some uh, several others. Uh, what? Uh, w why did you file this lawsuit? Uh, did you file it after Obama had put it in his executive order, or, or after? It was the after the guidelines came out because it was possible that the NIH might have said, "We can't fund this research because it's illegal." We can't fund this research because it's not ethical, um, which they didn't address at all in these guidelines, I might say. And it could have been they were going to say it wasn't worthy. None of those things happened. And then at that point, other individuals need to act. And um, if you ask specifically why the lawsuit to stop the loss of human life that this research causes. Mm -hmm. and, and now take us uh, through some of the I, I believe there was like seven lawsuits. Uh, can, can you tell us uh, initially uh, what, what went on and uh, s some of the key points uh, over these uh, lawsuits? Yeah. Well, I have to say, this was uh, an education for me, how the law works, and I'm, I'm still taking this education, I guess. But um, so in the very first case of this type, one needs to establish standing, or the court initially evaluates standing, and it's whether or not the the plaintiffs have in fact been injured in some way. In the first lawsuit, basically the court said we were not injured in any significant way. Um, we appealed. That was the second case. In the second case, we won. And the basic idea here is that for this type of lawsuit, which is against the government, um, the plaintiffs have to have standing. They have to show that they've been injured in some way because of an illegal action of the government. And um, the second court, the Court of Appeals, said that two of us, um, Dr. Deischer and myself, had in fact been injured by this. And the injury comes from the fact that the government is telling how research dollars which are limited should be spent. And they're doing it in a legal fashion. That was the, 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 the case. The crux of the issue. Now, now uh, was that Chief Justice Royce Lamberth of the U.S. District Court in Washington, D.C.? Yes. Was, um, and he, what did he do, put an injunction in or something? Well, or? the first thing we asked was a preliminary injunction, which basically stopped funding of human embryonic stem cell research for a matter of weeks. A matter of weeks? Boy, that, so they turned it around really quick then. Uh, so, uh, well, how long was, from the initial lawsuit, how long was uh, funding shut down for embryonic stem cell research? I guess we can take March 9th of 2009 when Obama had this executive order. How long would you say after that? I lose track of the dates, um, but whatever was it a Shirley year Four or two was, years? I think, um, is a time when the government was awarded uh, an appeal to uh, restart funding. Mm -hmm. And why did uh, this particular judge, Royce Lamberth, uh, reverse himself one year later? Ah, case law. Case Things law. Things which I don't, which I must admit, I don't fully understand. But there were some. There are sort of two issues. Um, um, but ultimately, the problem was is that when you lose, and we may need a legal expert in the future for this. But when you lose uh, a case and you bring appeal, and you lose that appeal. The next time you bring appeal, you have to appeal something different. And so there was case law saying that, it's called the law of the case, which basically says that our side group wasn't bringing anything new to the court. I see. I know I did a little uh, reading beforehand, and uh, Judge Royce Lambert said, uh, Due to appellate law, this is a legalistic, a linguistic jujitsu that he had to perform to overturn himself, basically. And and then yeah, you've talked to me a little bit about how how was the Fourteenth Amendment misused in this case? So I want I want to, if I could, just go back just a bit. I want the public to understand why the case failed, and it failed over language and the law, basically that statement by Lambert is referring to the fact that ultimately this case hinged on the words, the phrase, um, in which... Research in which? Research in which. Um, and what do you mean by that? Well, if you read Dickie Wicker, it says that 
those things I said it was concerned about, risk putting embryos at risk or uh, causing injury to embryos, it was research in which that occurred. And the government made the case that the research could be partitioned, it could be separated, that embryos could be made over there and destroyed over there, and the embryonic stem cells produced be transferred over here to a different group, even if they're next door in the laboratory. And NIH was allowed to fund the research with the embryonic stem cells because they weren't actually funding the act that produced them. And that's where we are now. So we now have a situation where embryos can be made on this side of the table without funds from the government. The embryos are made however they come about. They can be, they can be killed. The embryonic stem cells are made. They can be transferred to the other side of the table. And their federal dollars can be used to fund the research. It's ludicrous. But it's the law. Well, how does this stand? Um, the court said that because of this research in which phrase, the law, Dickey Wicker, is ambiguous. And when, in case law, I guess, um, um, a rule of law is ambiguous, they defer to the guiding agency, in this case, the NIH. And so we have what the NIH recommended in their guidelines. That's where we are. And this is the kind of thing that we have to figure out a way to do something about. Now, this business about the 14th Amendment has to do with the issue of whether embryos are persons or not. It didn't come up in this, didn't come up in this particular case, whether they're legal persons. It didn't come up in this case, but it comes up in other cases that we know very well, and that would be uh, the decision in Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. Well, do you think that uh, if there was a human personhood amendment, that could help change things regarding embryonic stem cell research? I think it would change everything. If embryos had legal rights, as you and I do, then um, we'd have to take a different course in terms of how we handle their, their existence. It would, I see. Very, very interesting. Well, um, the, uh, now, uh, if there was a change in, uh, say, the Obama administration ends three years from now, whatever, whenever it goes out of office and a different, a more pro-life administration comes in, could they change what national, the NIH, National Institute of uh, Health, is that what it's, could they change uh, the line items as far as what is embryonic stem cell research? I think the beauty of living in democracy is that when we have better understanding and better knowledge, anything can change. And I just want to press, I know we're running out of time here, Right now, the issue of who was a legal person hinges on the idea of the 14th Amendment, which is not about life and rights. It's about citizenship. And so it's disingenuous to use the 14th Amendment to say that is the basis by which we will determine whether or not an unborn person is, in fact, a legal, has legal rights. Because the 14th Amendment is not about that at all. So we need a new amendment that addresses specifically the issue of our rights before we're born, our rights even if we're created in a test tube. And that's where we need to get to, I think. And that's one of the reasons why I want to do this type of education with the public, because many things need to be reported that are not being reported. I see. Very interesting. Well, some of your final thoughts on human embryonic uh, stem cell research. Um, I mean, do you feel that, that this research is just, we're throwing money down a, a rat hole, or a, that's kind of descriptive, but uh, are, we, are, we wasting, are we wasting money in this area? I think what we're doing more than anything else is we're misleading people. We shouldn't do embryonic stem cell research because we're destroying human beings to do it. However, there are things we can learn by doing it. But I like to think we live in a humane society where we make choices. And that knowledge, which can be get, gotten from, embryonic, uh, from induced pluripotent stem cells, is where we should do that. We shouldn't do it with human embryos. And I think the, most, the last message I'd like to, to end with is that, and it's important to get this out, I think, is that embryonic stem cells can't make every cell in the body. Mm -hmm. Meaning adult stem cells. Well, Dr. Shirley, if they, folks want to get in contact with you, um, how might they do that? Uh, my email address is uh, jlshirley at gmail.com. 
Okay, jlshirley at gmail.com. Well, in closing, um, we hope you learned a lot about two topics concerning embryonic stem cell research. We at Life Matters are confident that if people know the truth, they'll ultimately change their hearts and minds to pure love and kindness for the embryonic human being, the unborn, the sick and the infirm, the elderly, and all humanity. Thanks for watching. I'm Brendan O'Connell, your friend for life. Thank mm -hmm. you.